everybody, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 5 of History's Greatest Idiots, the show in which we go back through all of human history and give you examples of utter, complete stupidity so that you can take lessons from those incidents and never repeat those mistakes again. But who are we kidding? We're humans. Mistakes are part of our nature and they will continue to exist for as long as we do. And man, we've we've got some really interesting ones. I, I've got one which effectively works as a microcosm for modern life. So, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> Joining me as ever, it's my amazing co-host, Derek. Derek, how have you been, my man? How's stuff over with you? Uh, it's been good. Been yep. good. Uh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I'd say I'm learning how to cook with uh, my new thing that we were talking about uh, yeah. before the show. But I'm not really learning anything because I've got these recipe cards and I just follow it step by step and I make amazing things. But it's not like I even did it. Well, the thing is, I, and I think a lot of cooking, a lot of it's down to like memorization. It's like Julia Charles had to learn to cook, right? She went to the French thing, you know, the the very famous chef place, whatever it's called. And, you know, a lot of that will be about memorizing what works with what. Like I, I when I worked in a hotel, as a waiter, I would be able to tell someone what wine worked with what, like course or or like specific serving or whatever, purely because I'd memorized it. It's the same thing with cooking. You know, you memorize how to do things, measures of this, ingredients of that, and people still keep recipe books around, even professional chefs. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. Well, my memory is so bad that I can't even get through the recipe and with putting the card down. So I have to I have to have one hand with the card and the other mm. one does the cooking because I will forget and I got to have my finger on the spot that I left off of or I'll add way too much salt or something stupid. I don't know. <laughs> Toasty's here. He says Derek's wall looks like someone tried to make a, ply, uh, a pride flag with their eyes closed. I mean, I I love uh, your background. I really do. I I I really genuinely quite envious so i get it it's a multicolored brick background but it's awesome Love i, I like color. it too it was supposed to be black and white that's right yeah the wrong one and then i was like this looks cool this looks all graffiti it does <laughs> it really does a splash of colors really interesting you were talking about the cooking thing you know i was telling you before the show about the sauce i made for this chicken like this chinese style sauce that i had it was oh god it was so good so sriracha honey um and dark soy sauce ginger garlic and um i i i threw that all together anyway i was getting it from an instagram thing i saw and the reel with the recipe was just playing on loop in the background and the guy had like a really strong northern irish accent so like, now you put the garlic in and stuff <laughs> and my, my wife must have heard it continuously looping for about 15 minutes she's like please mute the volume it's driving me insane so <laughs> yeah um dude that's what we need we need cookbooks narrated by colin farrell we do we do the banshees of innis Sheeran version of every cookbook would be fantastic <laughs> i also just noticed the biblically accurate clock on lev's wall yes it, it is absolutely accurate the time is indeed now always um so yeah we've um it's it's been kind of a week my wife has got a cold which it's you know i'm fun. hoping oh no it's it's so it's not fun at all basically i've been like as soon as she got it i was like right you're gonna eat loads of garlic you're gonna eat loads of spicy food you're gonna like and just like battering as much like good stuff into her system as possible um and you've had a bit of a week so um i was gonna ask um specifically about um how things are looking for your potential move in the future now that you're looking at Oregon. Uh, oh, things, they're kind of looking good, I believe. I don't know. I'm kind of taking it day by day at this point. I've sure. gone back and forth on whether or not I want to uh, just make the move and, and live in an RV for a while. Because That's I, right. I yeah, you mentioned that. Remotely, and then you know, I could do this on the road. Mm -hmm. Just hang this Absolutely, up behind me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, things are looking good. We're getting things set up for Brad more than us. And right. I'm just assuming that I'll just do whatever I want, like I always do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a wonderful, wonderful thing to be in. But I do hope that um, you find a really nice place in Oregon. If, if any of our listeners are from Oregon, and I know because like when we look at our new podcast, Spotify for podcasters uh, analytics, we can see specifically sometimes which region some of our listeners are from. 
if any of you are from Oregon, um, oh, we've got someone here from Washington. Is that Washington State or DC from Washington? If oh, any of our listeners, go upper upper left, yeah, there, yeah. left that's uh, Washington State, Seattle, and that, right? Yeah, yep. It's just straight north of Oregon. Shitloads of rain, but uh, yeah. really lovely, amazing <laughs> things to do there. Uh, and so volcanoes. yeah, yeah. Shit, yeah, that's kind of crazy. Uh, if you guys, if any of you guys listening um, are from Oregon and you can kind of uh, point Derek in the right direction or maybe even hook him up with a cheaper place to live, that would be really, really oh. amazing. In a good neighborhood. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. With with exactly. quick access to fat... No, oh, not fast food. I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to get away from that. That's However, right. like, co convenient for lifestyle choices. Is, yeah, is what they're like not out in the sticks, you know. So, if Derek wants to go down to the local diner and have a coffee, he can. Let's, that would let's be, see yeah. Can, yeah, that'd be all right, you know. Just the option, I think, is good. It's like having it as a backup. Like, I'm going to save money, but if I want to, I can walk 30 minutes and go get a coffee down the road. So, well, I've, I've really taken to walking in the last three years. Mm. I walk more in the last three years than I did in the previous 17. That's really good. And I actually think that the move to Oregon is going to, it's going to be a different kind of walking because obviously you're going to have to have like all weather clothing and boots and shit like that. Whereas in Arizona, it's like you basically have like snake repellent or something, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Um, I'm going to get one of them big yellow slickers and look like the, yeah. the Gordon's fisherman going out on some of the walks, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Like a giant hat as well. And uh, if you really want to go for it, get those, uh, those walking sticks that those people oh yeah well you gotta have a stick fun. like like toast so it says here uh they've got bigfoots oh yeah <laughs> that's right you're in you're gonna move to bigfoot country that's gonna, gonna be fun. one it might end up just being matt graining you might just see matt graining <laughs> walking down the road it's like oh it's not bigfoot no it's okay it's just the creator of the simpsons that's fine so uh, um derek now that we've kind of covered how life is going for both of us can you tell us about your specific idiot this episode please Okay, well, the guy that I have for you today is just like everyone else that I have that makes bad decisions and affect people around them negatively. This dude is one of those, but his bad decisions were really, really horrible. Okay. But a lot of a lot of people were making the same decisions at the same time, but this guy right. just went all out for it. Here we go. He was born into two powerful families in Rhode Island, the DeWolfs and the Potters. Okay. He levered the, uh, leveraged the family business into great wealth for himself and a seat in the U.S. Senate eventually. Oh, wow. Uh, he's got descendants all over the place here in the United States in all walks of lives, including a filmmaker that we'll talk about later on because she's uh, pretty cool. Toastazoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is Peter Griffin? No, it's not Peter Griffin, unfortunately. Peter Griffin. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I forgot all about how he was in that fancy. Lois's family was all rich. Yeah. And they're all up there yeah. in the Northeast. <laughs> hilarious. Yeah. The, the, yeah. They're all the Vanderbilts or something like that. They were called. Yeah. Well, this guy himself was said to be the second risk, richest person in the United States when he died. Uh, wow. His name was James DeWolf and his family business yeah. was slave trading. Oh shit! Yeah, I was like, that name rings a bell, and then you said that. I was like, oh right, yeah, yeah. His family was one of the the big ones. We'll we'll get into it. James was born on March eighteenth, which is yesterday for those oh, of yeah. you watching live. Um, March eighteenth, seventeen sixty four, in Bristol, Rhode Island, to a wealthy and influential family. He was the fourth of five brothers and had four sisters. Although I could find the names of his brothers, I couldn't find any information on his sisters. I imagine that's because it was the 1700s. And, yeah, and history you know, is written by men. So. Yeah. Well, at least Land, you know white men. men. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, white men. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, anyway, his father was Mark Anthony DeWolf, who was a successful merchant and shipbuilder. That kind of plays into it later. Mm. He owned a bunch of ships that were involved in early slave trading with the Dutch. Um, James really leaned into that when he got his chance to take over. But during the American Revolutionary War, he was just a teen. And still, 
joined in the fight, took to the seas, and served on a private armed vessel as a sailor on uh, on the ship. He took part in several naval encounters and was oh. captured by the British. Hooray! Twice. <laughs> Why couldn't we have killed him? Uh, uh, sorry, no. We'll it's it because he was a young, young, young teen. Yeah. But they caught him twice, and he let him go quick because he was a teen or because his family was super stupid rich. Yeah, um, of course. Towards the end of the Revolutionary War, and before he even turned 20 years old, he made captain. He became the captain of a ship. And that's when he started to venture into the family business of buying and selling other humans. Wow. That's uh, so dark. He actually would bring enslaved farm workers from Cuba to the American South to work on plantations. And he kind of did that strategically. We'll get into more on that in a minute. Mm. Rhode Island banned slavery in 1787, though. So you would think that would have put an end to the family business, right? Well, yeah, but <laughs> it, yeah, it, people it, are going to find a way. Okay. Yeah, they continued to finance and run their own slave trade into Africa all that whole time. And one of those trips was super, super horrendous. And I'm going to get into it. Okay. And I, I want to say that it it's kind of intense and it could be. I don't know, triggering, I suppose. Yeah, let's put out a trigger uh, warning right now. for Just to be warned. Yeah, um, be careful. This is going to talk about violence and slavery. Um, <clears throat> also, I want to mention that this portion of the story is borrowed from the article James DeWolf, the Rhode Island senator who murdered a slave and got away with it. Uh, that was by the New England Historical Society. So according to this article, in 1789, James is the captain aboard a slaving ship called Polly. The, okay. Uh, an enslaved African woman in her middle ages came down with uh, po smallpox. Right. So they kind of freaked out. He ordered her to be quarantined and tied to a chair and eventually brought above deck. And when okay. she got worse, he asked for volunteers to just throw the, the sick woman overboard. But the the crew all refused, which... <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was this Anderson Cooper's ancestor. Yeah. He's probably related to a few famous people, I'd imagine. A maybe ton of people, I believe, came from this family. I believe he had, mm. he had like twelve or thirteen grandchildren Jesus. by the time he he passed. Um, so anyway, the crew refuses to throw the sick woman overboard, and the refusal was pro probably though because they didn't want to catch smallpox and not because they ah. were morally opposed to throwing somebody into the ocean. <laughs> yeah, because they're already on a slave ship, right? But, so, Yeah, he just, James decided to do it himself. He blindfolded her, he gagged her so the other slaves couldn't hear her scream and get worried, and then he got one sailor brave enough to help him with a grappling hook, and they attached <laughs> it to her chair and lowered her in the ocean where she sank like a rock, drowned, and died. And according to one crewman's testimony, James remarked afterwards, <clears throat> I regret the loss of such a good chair. Oh, my God. He's what a, a fucking rick. scumbag. Yeah. Holy shit. Jeez. So after that trip, James returns to Rhode Island on the Polly and records that he sells 109 slaves at a profit and he keeps 10 for himself. And in doing so, he broke the Rhode Island Act of uh, 1787, which decreed no slaves should be brought to Rhode Island. Good. Well, in Did 1790, James marries Nancy Ann Bradford, who was the great, great, great granddaughter of William Bradford, who was the governor of Plymouth Colony. Oh, okay. You know, yeah, yeah, Maine Colony, original. kind yeah, of a yeah. big dude. Her dad is also a William Bradford, and he's a sitting U.S. senator. Oh, fuck. So he married into a powerful family that has the ability to protect him right at this time when he really needs it. Yeah. And by 1791, though, he still became a wanted man, wanted for murder. A uh, warrant was issued for his arrest by Attorney General John Jay. And although like what what he did on board wasn't unusual, hmm. murder on the high seas was at this time now illegal under the Federal Crimes Act of 1790. Yeah, isn't it a capital offense as well? Like, isn't that a hanging offense? I'm not sure if it was at the time, but no, I believe eventually with the when you move into the whole pirates thing, mm, which is, yeah, yeah. I mean, right around the same time, right? Yeah, not not too far off. Um. Anyway, somebody blabbed about the murder aboard 
the poly and the federal grand jury investigated. But by the time they got it all together, James disappeared. Of course Off he, he goes <laughs> down. He's absconded to the Caribbean island of St. Eustatius, leaving his wife and children behind in Bristol because fuck them. I guess yeah. <laughs> I can um, find another marriage of convenience to keep me in power. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, I mean, he's down there running the business. So he's yeah. down there in St. Eustatius, continuing the slave trade business, corresponding with his brother. Uh, eventually, he gets discovered in the West Indies and they charge him with murder. Jeez. OK, good. Two men that were on that ship testified that they had thrown the woman overboard to save the crew and mm. other valuable cargo from catching smallpox. So it was yeah. totally cool. <laughs> that made the prosecuting attorney uh, formal uh, file a formal declaration that he didn't even want to prosecute the case. So what? James is free. He moves to St. Thomas, uh, settles into a good life for a minute, and he's charged with murder again. Good. Get yeah. this motherfucker. <laughs> this time, nobody would testify against him, so the judge oh. ruled in his favor and set him free. Oh, my God. What the fuck? Meanwhile, his well-connected family back up in Rhode Island is working to get those charges dropped in that state. And after four years of living in paradise and dodging murder charges, <laughs> yeah, they get the federal marshal in Rhode Island to drop the arrest warrant, and boom, James DeWolf pops right back home to Bristol immediately. That's fucking disgusting. Jesus. Upon his return to Rhode Island, he starts gathering power and wealth, and he serves for 17 years in the Rhode Island State Legislature as a senator, and in 1821, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. Wow. The entire time he's serving, he's continuing the slave trade with his brother and nephew and other members of his family. How the hell? So at this point, slavery's... What, what, what date are we in now? Um... Let's see. After the Civil War. Or 1791, the four years from there, yeah, 1795. So nowhere near the Civil War then. 1795 to 1821, he served. Yeah. Um, anyway, his dad started importing slaves and enslaved Africans in 1769. Right. His nephew George continued the family tradition until 1820. Jeez. So... The DeWolf family continued slave trade despite state and federal laws prohibiting most of their activities in the late 1700s. And their effort to avoid getting in trouble for this led mm -hmm. them to arrange a political favor with, uh, bums me out here to say this, but President Thomas Jefferson. Oh, God, yeah. So what he did was agree to split the federal customs district in Newport, Rhode Island, which allowed them to install their own customs inspector just for Bristol. Wow. Okay. Who ended up being the brother-in-law of James DeWolf. Of who, course. Who conveniently ignored any and all slave ships <laughs> moving in and out of the harbor. For and his I'm sure family he got a backhander business. for that as well. Yeah. Um, all in all, over 50 years and three generations, the DeWolf family brought somewhere in the ballpark of 11,000 enslaved Africans to the Jeez. United States. That's... Some some of them estimate as high as 12,000 people. Fuck, that's awful. Also, Tessoid with a great point here. Not the worst thing Jefferson did. Incredibly, that's true. Um, yeah, holy shit. Um, wow. 11,000 slaves. It's Yeah, it's believed that the DeWolf family was the most successful, if you can call something so oh. horrendous and horrible successful. I mean, uh, they were the most successful slave trading family in the United States, which... Probably not a thing to be proud of. No, and I'm sure somewhere in, I don't know, some part of the United States, there will be a statue to either this family or this man somewhere like that, because there's plenty of those in this country, even though a couple of them got torn down a few years ago. So, yeah. yeah. But wait, They'll... there's more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, in addition to those exploits, the slave trade and um murder. senate and politics and murder and all of that yeah. he also earns sugar and coffee plantations in havana yeah. and a rum a rum distillery and a mill and then him and his family start the bank of bristol right. and the mount hope insurance company which was a insurance company that what do you think they did 
uh, slavery stuff. They insured slave ships. <laughs> Fuck. You know. Um, between 1805 and 1807, the Mount Hope Insurance Company insured 50 different slaving voyages. And um, around that same time, James became the founding member of a consortium that formed the Arkwright Manufacturing Company in 1809, which right. built the Arkwright Mills in Coventry, Rhode Island in 1810. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I recognize so that name. He's getting into some textile industry here. Mm -hmm. I wonder why. Uh, during the War of 1812, he starts uh, fitting out privateers. Right. And they captured 40 British ships worth $5 million at the time. I don't know Holy what that shit. translates to because I was too lazy to do the research. Well, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, around that same time, is he, he's doing the textile manufacturing, and it expands like rapidly, blows yeah. up. And... Those textile mills get all of their cotton mm. from the deep south. Of course they do. Which is grown and picked and run. By slaves. Yeah. So Gross. he gets just shittiness all the way around this guy. Um, yeah. After his brief stint as a murderer and politics <laughs> and uh, just overall bad guy monopoly dude, mm. just run around owning everything. Um, he, he I told you he went to the U.S. Senate. That was right, March, yeah. March 4th, 1821, but he only served part of his six-year term. He resigned October 31st, 1825, which I don't know why, but it happened on Halloween, so I'm assuming it was a ghost that spooked his ass from, you know, maybe it was the one that he put in the ocean. Yeah. Oh, God, I hope so. Holy shit. Uh, he goes back from there to being a member of the Rhode Island House of Representatives in 1829, mm -hmm where he served until his death in New York City in 1837 at the age okay. of 73. Oof, he lived to an old age for that time as well. He did with a ton of descendants. And I, and I think it's important to mention that some of his descendants, like uh, Kat Katrina Brown, is a filmmaker who's making efforts to atone for the family's past. Okay, uh, good. She co-produced and directed the Emmy-nominated uh, Emmy 2008 documentary Traces of the Trade, a story okay. from the deep north, which you know breaks down mm -hmm. the Dwarfs family's role in the slave trade in the United States. Um, I've got a link that we can post for them to the yeah. PBS trailer to the movie, and I guess yeah, we'll post it in the description. Yeah, um, please, I I'd like to do that. That'd be great. Just to give folks a heads up, the Hollywood Reporter said the film is key point is that the nation can no longer afford collective silence and wild amnesia about slavery slavery and we must confront these issues of race relations if we're ever going to progress in the united states and traces of the trade is a place to start and you know i yeah. i think it's good that we need to address and look at this and and think about the fact that all of that whole area all of that stuff that he built all of the wealth that he had and created was off of other people's yeah. lives. <laughs> I know Stop. it's uh, it's so so grotesque, and you know, I mean, I'm in the UK. We are definitely not free and clear of like being able to say, "Oh, slavery, how terrible!" Because like Bristol, Liverpool, these are cities that were built literally off the back of slavery. And there's a place in North Wales that I used to go to regularly called um, Penryn Castle. It's actually not a castle; it's a folly built by an incredibly wealthy man called Lord Penryn, who um, was an anti-abolitionist because he owned plantations. And when slavery was eventually abolished, he transferred his wealth into local Welsh mining kind of interests and tried to treat the Welsh workers um, like slaves and pay them as little as possible and have them working in horrific conditions. And as a result of his awful treatment of the local workers, socialism was born in Wales um, and people started collective action and stuff like that. And Wales is a socialist country to this very day. So um, there's a part of that house. It's an enormous house. It's like Xanadu from Citizen Kane. It's got like <laughs> th 300 rooms and there's like four kitchens it's it's uh -oh. crazy. There's a whole ice room. There's an ice well. So this this like part of 
one part of the castle plunges down 100 feet into the ground and it's where they used to store ice because it was really really cold down there so that's where they'd refrigerate they bring the ice up and refrigerate stuff with it anyway within the house now because it's owned by the national trust is a display um kind of giving people facts about his involvement in the slave trade and the awful shit that he did and that's been put on by his descendants the the penryn family who still maintain like a, a flat within like the complex which usually happens with national trust places and again these people who are descended from this incredibly evil trade um that have benefited financially their entire lives want to make it known and it's incredibly uh fascinating when you look into like just just the levels of like bureaucracy that went into slavery and the the political and economic structures that were put in place to maintain it for as long as possible it's it's so staggeringly evil and the worst part is it's kind of tied with the early rise of um the industrial revolution and the dawn of capitalism and it's very difficult to view capitalism in any kind of positive light when you realize that a part of its birth is intertwined with the slave trade. It's so horrible. Yeah, um, it's mm, it sucks. It like, does. And I think it sucks that I don't feel like I had a good education on the mm. way shit actually worked. And you you were almost taught history in school, I believe, like rose colored glasses and great oh, yeah. stuff. And like this guy's out here fighting, you know, with the, the founding fathers and he's a hero of the country and, and he's just yeah. he's dunking women huge, into the ocean. And yeah, yeah. just an yeah. awful, awful human being. I, I have no issues rating this guy. Well, in the high nineties, this is, this is someone, and I know, you know, this thing where we venerate people who are important after they've died and that I'm sure that's happened with a lot of people in America who really don't deserve it, or at least have been kind of had their legacy reevaluated. This guy is every inch and every ounce of his legacy is dripping in evil, horrible shit. So I am quite happy to rate this guy like 97. Like he is a murderer. Ooh. Yeah, he's a murderer. He was directly, yeah, elbow deep in the slave trade caused the deaths and imprisonment and you know slave enslavement of tens of thousands of people and it's it's just i oh, I, I can't even wrap my head around why they were like oh yeah it's totally cool to own people I just make I, them I will, it for free i don't get it i i never i mean this whole it was a different time thing it really like people abolitionists who were mostly Christian, interestingly, particularly um, over in this country. Ironically, the guy who managed to get slavery um, for this podcast, anyway, the, the guy who managed to get slavery abolished in this country, I think he's William, was it Wordsworth? I can't remember his name. Anyway, he had Crohn's disease. They just didn't diagnose it at the time. So I've got a connection to him, and that's what eventually killed him early. But um, yeah, he was like a, a reformed uh, character who had been an awful person, and and generally the abolitionists knew and most people knew like slavery is horrible and this isn't like you know and people say oh well you look back at nazi germany and people were enthralled and they really didn't know it was evil no the people living in germany knew shit was horrible and evil and stuff was going bad like they knew and we've got testimony to that effect so i i'm pretty certain that's a similar thing and i mean i'm sure we we live in a world now where people can look back on it in 50 years and say things like oh you know the treatment of um, immigrants or, you know, the persecution of LGBTQ people. Uh, but it was just a different time. People didn't think about that. We genuinely do. We want it to stop. So I, I think people say that because they kind of want the same courtesy, maybe, because if you think mm. about what's really happening in the world right now, conditions yeah. in prison but they're bad people because they broke the law well, yeah. what laws did they break were they laws that were specifically designed to capture a certain portion of yeah. society yeah and the <laughs> idea that imprisonment helps reform people is completely counterintuitive when you look at the conditions these people are kept in you know prisoners even in the most liberal part of the world even in norway 
where people are allowed to go home on the weekend and they have the most incredible facilities. They are still removed from mainstream society. And I understand about rehabilitation and stuff, but imprisoning people and putting them through that kind of isolation and stuff is just, it's wrong. Anyway, that's the story for a different time. I don't agree with prisons. I think they're evil. But this guy, um, James DeWolf, whose name I will never forget now is an awful person, 97, that points him just one below. Um, our worst idiot of all time was um, uh, Thomas Midgley Jr., who essentially Killed doomed us all. the fucking planet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> he invented CFCs and leaded paint and leaded fuel. We're basically fucked as a result of him. But yeah, um, anyway, that was a really interesting one. Thanks for doing that, Derek. Um, it is dark, but it's important that we highlight these people. Um, I have something a little bit lighter but in many ways, this situation works as a kind of a microcosm for modern life with billionaires and everybody else. So, okay. <laughs> to, yeah, basically. I want to talk to you about modern capitalism versus medieval feudalism. And this is a, the story of when the Barclay brothers tried to destroy the island of Sark. So, Sark. yeah. Sark, S A R K. There's going to be a okay. lot of very fancy words in this because Sark is about as authentically medieval as you can get in the modern day times. Also, it's tied to Normandy. So you're going to hear a lot of very French sounding words and stuff. So the island of Suck, not quite <laughs> post Zoid, but the island of Sark, actually, Sark is kind of a bit heavenly actually and i'll get into that now so before uh, i should also mention uh credit for most of this certainly once we get into the kind of the verses section of it credit goes to an article from tortoisemedia.com which i'd never heard of until i did this article it's an article called um offshore folly written by jane martinson and before we kind of get into the the kind of the conflict, I should really tell you about Sark, the island. Um, it's part of the Channel Islands in the southwestern English Channel, not too far off the coast of Normandy. Okay. Um, so it's between England and France, much closer to France than England. But um, it's a British royal fief. That's F-I-E-F. -E it's a fiefdom. Oh. So, what? Yeah. What's a I know, it's fiefdom? crazy. We'll get into it. It's a medieval okay. term. <laughs> <laughs> Which forms part of the Bailwick of Guernsey. Now, Guernsey's another Channel Island along with Jersey and Sark and like I think the Silly Isles are in there as well. It, it's, it's a whole thing. Tiny little islands that have got like really strange tax laws and I'll explain why. Um, with its own set of laws, Sark now, based on Norman law and it has its own parliament. It has a population of about 500 people. This is a tiny fucking island. Everybody's so, in parliament. Everybody's in the parliament. <laughs> everyone. Just a giant senate, and then they go out, and there's no one to serve them food. Um, so, including the nearby island of Breckgau, Breckau, I think it is, has an area of 2.1 square miles, 5.44 kilometers squared. Little Sark is a peninsula joined by a natural but high and very narrow isthmus to the rest of Sark. So it's got like a, a bit of sand from okay. Sark and Little Sark here. And at certain points of the day, you can cross that bit of sand and other parts of the day, it's under the ocean. So, okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm um, kind of, okay. I see where I'm looking at the map right now. You're looking at, I guess yeah, I can it's, put it's that it's up for people tiny. if they wanted. It's yeah. <laughs> Please look up Sark. I've got to be honest. It's a really interesting island, and we'll get into it a little bit late, later on. They've got really weird traditions. But the real starting point for Sark is 933 AD. Sark was included in the Duchy of Normandy based on the traditional boundaries of the Lugdenesis Secunda and the Archbishop, uh, Archbishopric of Rouen. Following the no Arch Archbishopric, not okay. Rick. Okay, <laughs> Archbishopric of Rouen. Following the Norman conquest of England in 1066 by William the Conqueror slash William the Bastard, 
the island was united with the crown of England. So this part of France that had to that was part of like a Norman like region that paid like homage to the French king suddenly became part of England. Oh. So yeah, that's how we got bits of Norman France, uh, Northern France for like 250 years. Um, anyway, based on the traditional, but uh, I've gone on to that. Um, so it's incorporated into England in 1066. Um, in the 13th century, the French pirate Eustace the Monk, awesome name. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> having served King John, used Sark as a base of operations for his piracy. So this is when it starts to become a little haven for pirates. It's like Tortuga. In okay. Pirates of the Caribbean films. Um, <laughs> during the Middle Ages, the island was populated by monastic communities. But by the 16th century, however, the island was uninhabited and used by pirates, pirates as a refuge and a base. So they would, it's like there's places they could hide their ship. Yeah. Um, away from both because it's like quite rocky and it's a bit odd. So anyway, um, uh, in, and then there's some sand where they can bury their treasure. Essentially, yeah, and there's nobody there. So, and it's two <laughs> miles. So, where are you going to find it? Um, anyway, in 1565, the major turning point in Sark's history uh, really happens. Helier de Carteret, Seigneur of Saint Ouen in Jersey, receives letters from Queen Elizabeth I granting him Sark as a fiefdom in perpetuity in con on the condition that he kept the island free of pirates paid £1.76 every year to the crown. Now, there's a little bit of a deep dive into the £1.76. That's an amount that the Queen was desperate to get rid of pirates. She didn't put in the contract that that money was going to increase with the rate of inflation. So it was £1.76 forever. And his descendants just had to pay that every year. Now... Okay. Back in 1565, and I had to go to the Bank of England for this, that was the equivalent of £70,882.75, which, you know, back then was more than enough to buy you a two-mile-wide island and a few hundred peasants that you could put to work in the fields because you were their lord now. And so he had you, to do that every year. Every year he had to pay them that money. However, obviously now... You know, back then, it bought you an island and essentially a bunch of slaves because that's basically what peasants were. They weren't really getting paid. They get to keep some of the food and they got to live in these houses, but they didn't get really anything. Mud huts. Mud huts, essentially, yeah. <laughs> um, now, of course, pound seventy-six. that's like $2, which won't even buy you a Subway sandwich. So that's that's how much the current senior, whatever they're called, senior of Sark pays to the crown every year and he still pays it to this day because um the sorry the rest of this contract one pound 76 to the the queen and the crown every year uh, they had to keep the island free of sl uh, pirates not slaves and occupied by at least 40 men who were of um who were english subjects or swore an allegiance to the crown so basically he had to have a garrison of 40 guys who would fight off pirates if they tried to come on there and raid the place or or set up shop there, basically. Okay. And as a result of that, the rest of it was his. So 10% of the island is populated by his bodyguards and him. And at this point, it's medieval times. Um, the, this um, he, he started duly leasing 40 parcels of land known as tenements uh, at a low rent to 40 families, uh, mostly from St. Uon, where he was from, on the condition that a house be built and maintained on each parcel, and the tenant provided one man armed with a musket for the defense of the island. That's where the 40 men came from. Um, one man with a musket, though? Uh, well, one man each. Oh, so okay. 40 families, <laughs> one man each sort of thing, yeah. So the 40 tenements survive to this day, albeit with minor boundary changes. A subsequent attempt by the families to endow constitution under a bailiff, as in journey, was stopped by the Guernsey authorities who uh, resented any attempt to wrest Sark from their bailiff. So he, it's part of this like county, and he enforces it. And um, if you want to buy a property on the island to this day, you have to pay the seigneur of the island a huge commission on top of the house, the price of the house. But there are no taxes 
in Sark. Nothing. Income okay. tax, property tax. There's no, um, like, you don't pay national insurance, even though you get your health care free. You don't pay uh, council tax. So even though people come and pick up your bins and there's a police force and a fire service, you don't pay for them. Um, you, The only thing you pay is money when a property to the senior when a property changes hands and it's it's like a swiss system so even when when someone inherits it from say a parent who's dying they have to pay money to this guy so okay um so despite being briefly invaded by the nazis in world war 2 sark remained to all intents and purposes a medieval feudal form of government from 1565 through to 2008. Yes, that's right. For real? For real. <laughs> there were peasants working the land and paying dues to their feudal overlord at the same time that worldwide capitalist economies were crashing in the 2007 financial disaster. Whoa. It's, it's Dude, crazy. That's, that seems so weird. Like, it's so... The... It survived way past medieval <laughs> times past enlightenment past fucking wow early it, it passed it through the industrial revolution through all of the advents that we saw in the 20th and 21st century the black eyed peas were around releasing shit music about partying when people were still legally defined as peasants on this fucking island well, how does that work then they, they have to farm the land they farm and... the land because they lease it Okay. So um, they get to keep some of some of that, and um, the pro most of the produce goes to the senor, who then sells it and exports it. Okay, and I think like I haven't gone into huge detail about how this has evolved. I'm sure there's an element of profit sharing, or they get some sort of benefit system from the government for essentially being unemployed. But <laughs> um, yeah, they're still they were still classed as peasants essentially because they were tied to the land. And wow. they couldn't leave. Yeah. In the early 21st century, there were people farming the land under the, the kind of the demonstrative glare of an overlord. That is who hard paid to wrap your head around. For the privilege. <laughs> and I've got to be honest, I don't think there's too many men walking around with muskets on Sark these days. So if a pirate wants to land with 100 men, he's pretty much got the island. Um, so, yeah. But... Yeah, I mean, there's some cool stuff if you look on Google Maps. Oh yeah, a lot of guest houses. Uh, yeah, it's a very popular tourist destination, and uh, that's part of the reason why we get to this problem. Is the Barclay brothers, who were wealthy before they became wealthy, if you know what I mean, um, mm -hmm. went there on holiday a lot. Um, just another thing about Sark: cars are banned. There are no cars on Sark. You can walk somewhere. You can get on a horse. You can get on a horse and cart, or you can get on a bike, as in a bicycle. No motorized vehicles are allowed on Sark. Okay, but so, it's it's what two miles wide? Two miles wide. You can do. Yeah. That. I mean, you can do it. I walk three miles a day. You don't need a car on you two mile a island. Car, no. A bike will do it, and it's pretty <laughs> flat as well. It's not like it's mountainous or anything. Anyway, so let's get to the Barclay Brothers in 1993. Um, the Barclay brothers come on the scene and they are British billionaires who at various points in their lives, depending on like what year it is, owned uh, retail brands like Woolworths, Littlewoods. Yeah. I worked um, for them. You worked for Woolworths. Yeah. It's probably a different thing in America, but they owned like the European arm oh, of okay. that. So, uh, but yeah, I know. I know yeah. Woolworths <laughs> is a huge name for people of our generation. Um, they also own Littlewoods, Very, Yodel, which is kind of like a delivery service over here, over here, okay. handbag.com. Um, and they also owned newspapers like The European, The Scotsman, The Sunday Business, and the biggest of all of these, significantly bigger than the rest, The Telegraph, which is kind of like the fourth or fifth biggest newspaper in the UK, depending on who you talk to. It's a very highbrow ever so slightly less racist than others, Tory newspaper. Um, <laughs> they also owned um, one of the Ritz hotels. I don't know if it was London or if it was Paris, but they owned a Ritz. And around about the time they bought the Ritz, 
Parliament asked them, listen, you have an office in the UK, so you're doing business in the UK, yet you are classed as residents of Monaco, so you're not paying any taxes over here. Um, why are you living in Monaco, but you're doing business over here? And the, one of the Barclay brothers went, <coughs> it's for health reasons. Oh, I'm so sick. Oh, the warm sea air helps uh -huh. me feel better. And everyone's like, the NHS is fucking free, bitch. You have to pay private <laughs> health care over in Monaco. You could get you, the most you're going to pay is like nine pounds for a prescription. Get your ass over here and pay some fucking tax. Anyway, uh -huh. so they lived in Monaco. They didn't like paying taxes. And then they've spent a lot of time on Sark, which doesn't let anyone pay any tax except property tax when something changes hands. Um, Alistair Barclay, and this is where we get into the article, and it's quite it's quite a narrative, so I'll, I'll give it to you as it is. Okay. Alistair Barclay was a young boy when his father and uncle bought the island Bracau in 1993. So that's the little, tiny, little Sark. Yeah, off off over of there. Main yeah. Sark, yeah. They started building their mock Gothic castle and fell out with the local neighbours on Sark, the island next door. You can actually, if you Google... Barclay Brothers Sark, you can see like from the ocean, there's a picture of their giant fucking folly and it is massive. It looks ridiculous and I don't know what the hell they were thinking, but you know, I'll buy this island, I'll build a fucking stupid castle. I've got billions, you don't, sort of thing. <laughs> it's basically. a cool castle though. It's cool, but what the fuck, man? <laughs> Come on. Should Why I show there? people? Yeah, it's, it's so difficult. And also um, like they said, it's they're kind of isolated, so it's a bit Bond villainy, really. You know, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I can't find it here now. I, I, it's it's so funny <laughs> though. In the spring of 2019, the youngest of Sir Bark Sir David Barclay's sons sent word that he wanted to meet Christopher Beaumont, the 23rd Signor of Sark. So, from 1565 to 2019, there have only been uh, 23 Signors. So only 23 people have like essentially owned that island in 500 okay. fucking years. Whoa. How I is know. that? How? I, Jesus, they, they must be old immortals people. or something. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, it's, Man. That's what it is. They're vampires, yeah. huh? Basically, Ooh, I yeah. got the castle. If anybody wants to see it, I can show it. Oh, right yeah. Here. Can we can we pop that up on the, the live stream? You managed to, to get that up. Sorry yeah. for the people listening, but if you Google... Um, Sark Barclays Castle. Look at that thing. It's got fucking high walls. Yeah. And everything. That's so ridiculous. And then you've got like these just off to the side, you've got like, these little bungalows. <laughs> yeah. Just like unassuming well, next to it. <laughs> can you see my pointer? These little yeah, suburban yeah, yeah, houses yeah. over here. These tiny neat. suburban houses. And then this big fucking ridiculous <laughs> like um, castle. It, it almost looks like Excalibur in Vegas. Yeah, it does. It does. It looks like a <laughs> Vegas hotel. Holy shit. Uh, it looks like Downton. Oh, my God. That thing looks like Downton Abbey, only right in front of a cliff. Oh. Jeez. Oh. Anyway, so there we go. Um, if, if you are following us, by the way, in the podcast, you can find us on YouTube and, and watch all the videos. And also, sorry, there's an hour. We did it again. I, to, I, did, I forgot again. If you want to follow <laughs> us on Instagram, go to History's Greatest Idiots and on Twitter, it's at Greatest Idiots. And also, if you go to patreon.com slash History's Greatest Idiots, you can uh, sling us some dough and help us help us live like, like the Barclays and build our own castle. I do want a castle. So. I do want that fucking castle. <laughs> anyway, so the 23rd Signor of Sark on the, um, met with uh, Sir David Barclay's son on uh, the 80 acre granite rock, which had been given to Beaumont's predecessors by Elizabeth I. For most of Alistair's life, the Signor and his islanders have felt it need, uh, felt uh, the need to be guarded around the Barclays, and we'll get to why. Alistair came bearing gifts. He had a silver inkwell engraved um, at, to the Dame of Sark on her 25th wedding anniversary by the Islanders. Alistair returned to... Um, sorry, Alistair returned it to her great-grandson along with a handwritten note from his father who had bought it when Christopher's father sold many of the house's contents. So they're, they're swapping gifts, okay. basically. It's like a... An olive branch is being reached here. 
Um, Beaumont, an amiable former army, uh, former army major who lived in the UK until his father's death in 2016. He's the descendants rule this island. Okay. It's a kingdom, basically. Um, shows me the sparkling set one dark January evening while sitting in the Signori, the grand manor house, uh, which comes with the job. It's it was such an incredible gesture, he says. Early earlier gestures from Sir David had been just as incredible, but possibly less generous. The Barclays' dealings with the inhabitants of Sark uh, since buying the island next door in 1993 have been marked by fierce legal battles, complicated business dealings, and seemingly inexplicable retribution when thwarted. Yeah, oh. these fuckers are vindictive. I swear to God. The Barclays had repeat, repeatedly called for the old signor to be removed from office, both in private and in the pages of the Sark newsletter run by his former estate manager, Kevin Delaney. So this guy's a very important figure in the story. We'll get Worst to neighbors there. ever. They're like, you're fucking shit. And, uh, <laughs> and then they print it. And yeah, it's just this nasty vitriolic thing. The Barclays wanted the Signori out so bad that in 2010, they offered his family £2 million in return for his feudal lease and title. So they wanted to be feudal overlords of this island and pay the crown £1.76 a year instead of whatever fucking taxes they would have to pay to the British crown. Gotcha. Because they want to, you know, they like living in Monaco, but it's handy if the place you live on and essentially own is a helicopter flight from London, you know, like yeah. forty-five minutes in a helicopter, and it home. cost you two bucks, and it cost you like less than a subway sandwich <laughs> to live there for fuck's sake. <laughs> um, despite a democratically elected parliament by then, the title still allows the Signor um, to veto legislation and appoint the island's judge. So it's kind of like the Queen, like you can do it, but it rarely happens, sort of thing. Um, yeah, it seems as weird well as... to think about that there's a judge on an island that doesn't have cars. I, know. I don't know why that seems weird to me, but it does. <laughs> oh, it's so crazy. But also, um, this the, being the senior comes with other perks as well, um, as well as um, owning doves. He's the only person on the island that's allowed to own doves because that's a medieval thing. And also, he's also, he's the only person on the island who's allowed to have an unspayed bitch. So... <laughs> <laughs> Every other dog has to be spayed or neutered, but his dog can walk around going, hey, boys. Oh, hey. man, that is a weird rule. That's okay. so fucking medieval, isn't it? It's like, you may own a pig, but you may not walk it across this bridge because then you'll have to pay a toll to the toll master. It's, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> it's so weird. Uh... Um, anyway, when he was offered £2 million, he declined because... I mean, you know, why not? He's making shitloads of money off this island already. Um, but they really wanted this fucking island. So when the 22nd Signor died in July 2016, Sir David is rumoured to have asked to buy the rights again from his son. But no one, least of all the current Signor, a man who wants to be on better terms with his billionaire neighbours, will confirm this. So it's just sort of a rumour. But yeah, they're, they're definitely trying it. The Barclays' long-running battles with the, their neighbours on Sark seem inex, uh, inexplicable to residents. Having bought their own granite rock on Bracau and built a palace on it, why spend decades at war with the locals across a narrow strip of water? Um, with its own laws in Parliament for its now 450 strong population, the real the royal fief of Stark is difficult to get your head around in some ways. Its system of governance and way of life have remained largely unchanged since the first seigneur arrived with 40 armed men in the 16th century. Islanders still travel on foot, bike or cart as cars are banned. This is when at this point I was like, I kind of want to move to Stark. It, it's a sock even some of that seems really cool but then i'm also thinking like if you're not a billionaire <clears throat> mm. what the hell do you do there do i have well, a farm i uh, that's the thing there seem to be like the people who own the parcels of land have mm -hmm. sold off bits of it for development so there are now houses that aren't tied to, you don't have to fucking sow seed and shit like that, you know. You can now be a normal working person. You can work down the local news agents. You can okay. work in the local restaurant. You can work at the local bar. You can wait tables in the, the hotel's restaurant. Or 
you can work remotely over the internet and work for a podcast agency and be a voice actor like me. Interesting. So, and I need a work visa. Contact. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there's a visa <laughs> or if we can just buy the fucking next time and go, you who you suck. We're here now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, mm. it sounds awesome. No cars, just a bunch of bikes, really beautiful scenery, very quiet, peaceful way of life. Great food. Yeah, I know this is a super American thing, probably here. Go on. Um, if they were like peasants, all that whole like, how did they? How do you dress? Like, where do you get your clothes? How do you get clothes? I mean, how do you get money? Like, I don't I, know how any of that works. I don't either. I have no uh, answers for you on this one. <laughs> it's so, it's so unusual to find that there was a place in the world that still had medieval ways of working in two thousand and eight. Fucking crazy. It is. That shit should have died out 400 years ago. It uh, just You just had to not notice it because it was just, no. like, it's just the way it is. It's just a tiny fucking two mile island. What are they doing over there? Oh, they're sacrificing people in a giant wicker man? Sure. <laughs> That's normal. Um, anyway, it's believed by holiday makers, including the Barclay brothers themselves as children. Um, sorry, it's beloved by holiday makers, including the Barclay brothers themselves as children, and also those seeking a tax-free life. There is no income tax, no capital gains tax, or inheritance tax, nor any recipro reciprocal arrangement with other jurisdictions. The tax system, such as it is, is based largely on the property and system similar to the Swiss forfeit. So you have to pay a little bit of money when you buy a house and when you die and pass it on, even though okay. it's not an inheritance tax, the person who gets the house has to pay some money to the senor. That's the only tax there is. Um, I guess the if Barclay... that's the only tax, it's, that's a good tax. It's fine. You know, let's say you buy a house for like 300 grand and you have to pay another 30 grand of that to the senor, but you never have to pay taxes again. I'd fucking do it. Yeah, it sounds good you to know? me. It's a deal right there. Like Instead of losing five grand a year in taxes... I'll fucking give you 30 grand on top, mate. Here's your backhander. Do you want it in a brown bag? I'll give it to you anywhere you want. A giant check or anything. Um, anyway, the Barclays themselves have argued that they have helped the island. And indeed, some local families have benefited from their presence, both from jobs and also from their readiness to buy up land and property. The Barclays currently hold more than 25% of the actual island's property Ooh. so they've just bought up house here house here land here land here and developed it and built businesses and bought businesses and stuff like that but they've got a stranglehold on the fucking island's economy this it isn't a good thing like yeah when you've got angry billionaires getting them to own property you're basically getting into lex luther territory here so uh yeah in 1995 the barclays petitioned the european court of human rights against uh, Sark's primogeniture, let me try that again, primogeniture law of inheritance, which would have left everything to their eldest son and meant that they would have to pay a huge amount of tax on the receipt of the house. In the mid-2000s, the brothers went back again to Strasbourg because they were declined by the European Court of Human Rights because they're like, um, excuse me, we're trying to try war criminals here. You, we're not going to arbitrate your fucking house deal. All yeah. right. Yeah. They went back to Strasbourg in the uh, the mid 2000s to plead that Sark's form of governance based on feudal landowning rights was wrong as it was undemocratic. I want you to remember that phrase. OK. Undemocratic. undemocratic. Okay. The Sark legislature changed both their inheritance and political laws. And as a result of this, the litigation was withdrawn. So they changed because they knew it was coming. They were like, right. We had a good run. Feudalism was nice for 500 years. It's time to join the rest of the world. But the Barclays weren't done. The disputes continued, most infamous, uh, infamously, after the candidates that they had promoted for the new Democratic Parliament failed to get elected. Whoops. These two billionaires placed their own puppets in a local election and lost. That's democracy right there i guess i feel like some other millionaire plays puppets yeah. and things and lost and it's about to get even more 
reflective of what we're seeing in the world around us now. Kevin Delaney, again, the man responsible for administrating basically all of the Barclays businesses on Sark, was quoted after the election when his his boys lost. His quote was, Sark has effectively written the longest commercial suicide note in human history. Soon after the election, Delaney started to shut down the Barclays businesses on the island, leaving roughly a quarter of the island's population facing unemployment at Christmas. That's messed up. That's so fucked up. Democracy so they're like, oh, you, you didn't elect our guys, so now you're yeah, all so fired. Fuck you. It is Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Democracy or else, motherfuckers. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Richard wow. Axton, Sark historian and Cambridge fellow, is, like many islanders, baffled by the Barclays' behaviour in Sark over the years. Regardless of their former employees' newsletter, their aims were totally contradictory and opaque. They had positioned themselves as wreckers of feudalism and champions of democracy and reform. But when Sark didn't elect any of their candidates, they claimed that they had no representation and basically went fucking mad. Um, yeah. That's not democracy, boys. Um, the Barclays yeah. also asked for the... Re this is the grossest part of it all. The Barclays asked for the return of their £200,000 donation to build an island hall and a school because they said they weren't told about an on-site bar. They sued okay. the four trustees of the charity, ordinary islanders, including a nurse and a garbage collector. An English judge providing in Sark found against the Barclay brothers and made them pay all the costs. Good. The yeah. fucking scumbags are trying to take money back from a donation they made to charity because their boys didn't get elected to a parliament. Wasn't that a Seinfeld episode? I feel Looks like it different. was. <laughs> it's so <laughs> fucking crazy. This just shouldn't be happening. It's 2014 and they're still doing shit like this. Anyway, in 2014, the Barclays lost a further argument with the, li uh, the island's legal system. Uh, they said that it was incompatible with European human rights law, but um, not before going all the way to the Supreme Court. They took it right to the absolute zenith of the legal system in Europe. So one local resident said, they've weaponized the law against us and we've done nothing wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you haven't. You're just trying to live. And these fuckers are trying to take over your island. And because they, they're not able to, they're fucking ruining your life. Yeah, they and, and yeah, they're like, oh, democracy's great. As long as you all want what we want, otherwise, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Our boys in charge. At the same time, 55 islanders made a legal complaint in an attempt at a class action case in Guernsey alleging harassment against the newsletter run by the my by Delaney. And the Barclay brothers. Uh, they were unsuccessful in the complaint because the Barclays threw shitloads of money at it. And Guernsey were like, oh, money? Yeah, okay, you're right. Um, in 2012, Lord McNally, not Rand McNally, uh, <laughs> the government minister with responsibility for the Crown Dependencies, so that's like all the islands that like the UK still owns, like the Falklands and... and Tristan de Kooner and random shit like that um, <laughs> told the Guardian he deplored the newsletter's tone adding that a number of people have said to me that it was the sustained nature of the attacks in the Sark newsletter that made them withdraw from public life the newsletter still targets some individuals including most recently a visiting Financial Times journalist so let's run through this again you've got billionaires who say that they are reformers They've tried to buy elections and failed. As a result, they forced working people into poverty, and now they're threatening journalists who are exposing the truth. All because, all because they didn't want to pay taxes. Welcome to the 21st century, Sark. This is what <laughs> you've got to face up to. These wow. fucking billionaires ruining your lives. And for 500 years, they were all left alone, minding their business, and then these billionaires come in and just... Well, I just get. I just want to sow my seeds. I just want to go out in the field. I just want to get my plow, and I just want to work in the sun, and then come home to a plowman's. <laughs> That's all I want. If the Lord wants a little bit more corn this year, then I'll put in an extra hour. But nobody's trying to fucking sue me in the Hague, are they? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that was my. That was my. 
Sark impression, it mostly Bristol. Um, having been too busy before a holiday to meet in person, Delaney, who was uh, fashioned himself as a pamphleteer in the historic journalist tradition, sent this response to a tortoise media uh, request for comment. This is the place I got the article from. Mr. Delaney has no idea who you are, and nor does he have any idea who or what you purport to represent. He will not, therefore, be responding to your inquiry. If your mission was to make yourself sound like an out-of-touch arsehole, then well done with that fucking statement. You Nailed are it. good enough for me to talk to. <laughs> so fucking... It sounds hard. like Lois is dead. Um, it, I swear to go. God, yeah, that's what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with ultra-rich wasps who, for some reason, want to control everything around them. And they just don't seem to realize that the 450 people who can actually decide their fate, and in this case they are, because the Islanders are constantly owning the Barclays' arses in court, they hate you, and they can't seem to understand why they're hated. It's because you're making everyone's life a misery so that you don't have to pay taxes. See, that's and that's it. what it is. You just have too much money in your board, and when you're bored, yeah. you're an asshole, I guess. And you don't care about like affecting society around you. You'll just fuck with anyone. Yeah. So it's so crazy anyway the legacy of the barclays purchase is not easily forgotten by the islanders nor the years in which the land owned by brothers more than one quarter of the island has been left unproductive so all of this land farmland they've just not farmed it just let it go to rack and ruin huh. um yeah the island's population has dropped from a, rec uh, a recent high of 600 to just over 450, and numbers in the island's school of half to about 28 in the last decade. Man, that is... That is a class size. Oh, that's not even a class. That's the whole school? No. That's the whole fucking school. Oh, man. 28 kids. Wow. You better be getting a good education in that place. Well, like, God, you, you can't, though. To... They're going to teach them all at the same time. You I get know. the older kids teaching the younger kids. That's it's so fucking weird. <laughs> um, Paul Armagy, Ar Armagy, who sold his hotel group stocks to a local group and not the Barclays, said decades of legal battles and more have left a mark on the fabric of this society, not least because there can be no employment in shuttered businesses. Yet over the past year, there have been signs of real change on the island. Last summer, a restaurant owned by the Barclays and at least one hotel opened. So, new restaurant, new hotel. It's a start, at least. More than 200,000 vines planted in a failed viticulture experiment that tried to make Sark wine. Uh -huh. Nobody wanted that shit. Have mm -hmm. been pulled up, and the land has been returned to bee farming. So, you know, thank God. The bees? Sark people... Sorry? Bees oh, or beef. beans? Beef. beef. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Moo cows. Okay. So now the Sark residents can get more protein, thank Christ, other than just fish that they catch because they I was can't all excited anything. that they were going to have bees. We need more bees. Yeah, bee farming. Shit, do that, please. Um, in many ways, this makes sense. Why would anyone, even billionaires, this, are, this part of the article is the only part that made me laugh. In many ways, this makes sense. Why would anyone, even billionaires, keep properties closed during peak holiday seasons? Yes, because no billionaire in the history of humanity has ever done anything out of spite, have they? They've always just been really, oh, no, I just need to make money. I don't care how it comes. Like, no, fuck you. They do everything out of spite. It That's is pretty neat how they'll lose money over spite, but damn it, yeah. if they're going to lose money to do anything good for anybody. I know. You, <clears> you tried, <throat> you donated so that you could have a school and a town center. And then when you didn't win an election, you tried to get that fucking money back by suing a nurse and a garbage man. What the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah. Um, in 2012, the Barclays denied they were motivated by money in Sark and said, we have no invest. Uh, we have not invested in Sark to make money. Well, no, you're doing it to dodge money. Our motivation is the common interest of Sark and Bracow as well as a genuine love for the Bailwick, where our family has spent a considerable amount of time for decades past, long predating our purchase of Bricow. No one's buying that shit. You're billionaires. Of course you're doing it to some financial benefit, you know? You would think, um, yes. Yeah. 
One local resident with a history and finance degree said of the recent signs of reproachment, I think what's happened is the next generation or even generation after that has said, this is a money pit. And he's 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 right about that. Throughout their time on Sark, Sir David has become the dominant force with Sir Frederick, his brother, hardly seen for years. Over the past year, the relatively new senior, Christopher Beaumont, has worked hard to mend fences. I found him very reasonable, but I've yet to work out what he wants with Sark, he says of Alistair Barclay, the youngest son of Sir David, who has variously dabbled in motor racing and online property companies. He sounds like Mark Thatcher to me. Yeah. So lost maybe we'll get in the lost desert. in the desert. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, many islanders have tried to work out what the entire family wants from this tiny, uh, tiny island near France. With Sark being the smallest crown dependency, I believe they genuinely felt and may still feel that they could be in full control of Sark and masters of their own destiny, responsible only to themselves, says Paul Armagree. They could make their own rules, and so effectively they could be their own mini-state. My theory is that this is all about their own domain, like a mini-Monaco with privacy, secrecy, tax benefits, and being in control of all of those things. Jersey and Guernsey are run by politicians over which they have no control. The theory is not uncommon among Sarkis. At least four islanders I spoke to, this is the writer of the article, um, to um, I spoke to link the Barclays' plans with the creation of a new Monaco, and yet the twins already live there. Some people on the island suggest that a mini Monaco within a helicopter day trip to London could fly under the radar of international authorities trying to clamp down on offshore jurisdictions such as Monaco and even Guernsey, where a financial services commission exists to keep an eye on offshore transactions but doesn't on Sark. Feelings were strong enough for an online petition to be launched to save Sark from the uh, the Barclay brothers. Just under 14,000 people backed a complaint that the Barclay brothers are trying to turn the island of Sark into a personal tax haven through propaganda and coercion. That's 35 times the number of the people that live on the island voted to get rid of these fuckers. It's kind of... yeah. Yeah. Well, I got to say, though, I kind of feel like at this point they're still going so hard after it just because they were told no. Yeah. And I, actually, that is the, the exact point that the journalist comes up with here. Um, all this furore seems a world away from the quarterly meeting of a chief please um, attended by just 13 of the 18 elected councillors and only 18 politicians on Sark running the entire island. Apart from the fact that the session begins um, with the Sarkis version of the Lord's Prayer and three and and the three women somewhat inexplicably wear black hats, which is some sort of hangover from medieval times, maybe. I don't know. Um, other than that shit, the meeting is like any other local council meeting with concerns raised over electricity prices, the difficulty of appointing a new doctor, and the need for a new boat. Just, I need a new boat. All right, we'll try and find it in the budget. Uh, Christopher <laughs> Beaumont, who is keen to help re-establish a new island dairy and has helped organise music festivals with his wife, Sarah, since moving into the Signori, that's what it's called, wants to move on from the island's long dispute with the billionaires next door. Bes uh, besides, he has no idea why the two men battle for so long with the islanders, including his father. Why Sark, he says. Perhaps it's because it's something that money can't buy. There it is, yeah. There it is, and you are absolutely right. They want it because they can't have it. Because they keep... It's that it's that girl that keeps turning you down. No matter what you tr do to try and impress her, she keeps saying no, but that just makes you want it more. And these fuckers are out of their minds for their own private fiefdom. And that's essentially what they tried to do. They tried to buy the title so that they could be lords of peasants in the 21st century, despite then saying, no, 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 we want to bring democracy. You tried to buy the fucking... Right. Try thing. to buy the democracy. You, you know. can't do that. That's not democracy. Oh, I know. <laughs> it's another example. And I, I this is why I loved researching this when I, I found out about it. Because I was, I mean, I knew a Sark of like mostly from there's a ship, a very famous ship in this country called the Cutty Sark, 
which was like okay. a wreck or something anyway um i was completely unaware that it was a fiefdom until recently i was unaware of the barclay brothers trying to fuck with every single person's life and all of this craziness and when i read it i was like this is just modern day life this is two billionaires like trying to buy whatever they can so they don't have to pay taxes and then just ruining everyone's lives when they don't get their own way. Yeah. And it's just a perfect microcosm of the world we live in at the moment. So what do you think of the Barclay brothers and the Island of Sark? Because there's a lot to talk about here. First of all, the fact that it's a, it was still a fucking feudal government until 2008. That's so weird. It's and then, so weird. like, I can't wrap my head around how that even works. Like if you're born yeah. there and you grow up and then like, do you leave? Do you, do, is there television? I like, I don't know how, how does that work? I, so, so there is TV. There's, okay. there's there's internet. There's TV. You know, there's music festivals. Shit How like does that. the internet and TV get installed? Then uh, like they just pay for the rich. Yeah, the they'll have bought, a, part, they'll pays have bought for a mask it? and the. I guess because so okay, um, because it's a a crown protectorate or whatever it's called. A lot of these islands are like supported by the British government. So Tristan de Cunha, which is where. Um, was that Nap where Napoleon was sent? No, that was St. Helena. St. Helena, another British depend uh, dependent, dependent thing. Basically, they get sent stuff by the British government. So they get sent building supplies. They get sent food. They get sent equipment. They occasionally get sent, like, nurses, doctors, you know, stuff okay. they need to make shit happen on the island. Um, and they're basically supported by the crown which effectively means the government at this point so um and that's what will be happening here you know they don't need roads so the infrastructure doesn't need to be built for that but you know the crown will build sewage facilities it'll build a fire station a police station it'll build power. maybe a jail power it'll give them internet access it'll give them um electricity it'll uh maybe tie them to jersey through a power line or something like that you know and, and these are all things that the british government will do to support these dependents because they're kind of strategically helpful i guess um especially places like the falklands dare i say it kind this of one was helpful. more so strategically important when there were pirates yeah exactly so and also like you never ever underestimate when you're looking at british history and politics the power that traditional shit has over the the kind of the minds of politicians like oh my god sock oh that's so cool wow let's support let's send them 10 million quid let's send them 50 million quid let's give them internet let's give them all this but they're still fueled should we maybe make them into an actual council no 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 fuck it just leave them to it it's traditional <laughs> great that's fine so that's what that's what sock is so all the stuff that you can imagine about modern life they have except cars basically so and they have the, but it's free. Um, no, they'll still have to pay for it. Okay. But they'll be getting either unemployment benefits because they're part of the UK's government, I would imagine, or they'll be earning money through like some sort of modern way. I'd imagine they get wages. One of the places the Barclays didn't close. Yeah, one of the few businesses remaining open in, open on the island. So, yeah, um, that's Sark is weird, but it sounds kind of cool at the same time. It reminds me a little bit of what's uh, Newfoundland. Reminds me a little bit of that. Okay. Like where you go to Newfoundland, um, as it's said, you can kind of hear in some of the residents uh, the leftover remnants of the people. The accent is still the same as it was for the people who landed on the island, you know, hundreds of years ago when people emigrated to the United States. So they've still got the same accents and way of speaking that people in the uk or other parts of the world won't have heard for four five hundred years because that way of living has not been interrupted so it's which is very cool as hell yeah i almost I wish love i would have been able to go up, grow up that way however mm. i do enjoy the internet and doing my yeah. little i do show enjoy here. antibiotics yes and yeah. like clean stuff and uh women in positions of power that don't have to wear like black hoods or some shit like that's weird that's, yeah, that's weird. Here, but, put this on. You're, you're, you're. It's, shut up, woman. Put this over your head. You're <laughs> ruling now. Uh, yeah, so it's it's odd, but it sounds slightly idyllic. Um, but then the Barclays are obviously like, ooh, this could be ours. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's basically th this whole, we want to do it for Sark. No, you're not 
fooling anyone, you know? Yeah, you want to do it for Barclays. Yeah, exactly. You want to do it because you don't want to pay tax anywhere, but you want to be closer to home, so you want to move from Monaco to Sark, basically. So, yeah. Yeah. God, these guys suck. Just the turning, <laughs> yeah. turning people like, just, hey, you know what? I didn't get my way, so now you are all fired. Yeah, exactly. Just and And to not just do that, because, like, I mean, that in itself is probably illegal. Like, just like, hey, I didn't get my way, you're fired. They actually announced it through their spokesperson who was like, you just signed your own death warrant and you just shut the whole fucking place down. God, basically. something in the international court needs to happen against them, don't it? Well, yeah. And also, like, leaving fields to go fallow and not be farmed. Like, you're, you're actually threatening the nutritional stability of the island and the health of yeah. the islanders at that point because if they can't get like sustenance because say there's not as much food as there normally is then you know you put a burden on the british government i just i don't understand the thinking so much of their thinking is so counterproductive to what they say they're trying to oh achieve. yeah achieve and even if it's like even if they came out and said we just want to live here tax free fuck it you know that's that's what we want to do even if that was your goal what you're doing is completely counterproductive because now everyone hates you. Yeah. So it's the kind of thing that is so fucking stupid and so egotistical that only cult leaders and billionaires would do it. Exactly. And that's why. Yeah. So I'm going to score them. <laughs> obviously not <laughs> as high as James DeWolf, who was a murdering slave trade person, but pretty fucking insane, these guys. Yeah, they're, they're a solid 85 I, I will take 85, yeah. They suck. Yeah, just <laughs> fucking with people's lives because they can. Yeah, and uh, that is that is uh, that is an idiot. Just yeah. ruining people's lives because they can. And that's, I mean, that was ultimately why I chose this story. Because they were like, we're going to fuck with the local population because we're not getting our way. But then I learned about Sark and how fucking mad it is. And it does I sound like the island from the Wicker Man a little bit, you know. But oh yeah, it would be cooler if it were like a big hippie commune. That would be cool. And I mean, to be honest, you know, four hundred and fifty people. They probably know everyone. Probably knows everyone's business. I would imagine, you know, it's kind of like that. I'd imagine the pace of life is very slow. It'll be because it's got traditional values. It'll be pre-industrial. So this place has never been affected by the industrial revolution. So the idea of a nine to five and weekends will just probably not really exist in a way Gosh. of living. So you'll just work until the job is done and then right. stop working. Which yeah, is that makes sense. Great. Yeah. That makes absolute sense to me. Work until the job is done and then stop. It's actually the one place where that still remains true is French wine makers who have a saying which translates in English to um produce what is it work less produce more. So you go hard as you can until your job is done and then you stop even if it's like midday two o'clock three o'clock you just stop and then you so, fuck off down the pub or something so i should have been a french winemaker because that's my Basically. theory is i will work and get everything done so that yep. i can be left alone absolutely yeah there's uh going back to uh the welsh philosopher whose name i forget every single time he said that any society that works more than four hours a day has failed as a society because there should be enough work for people to just have to work four hours and then enjoy the world around them and live in comfort. Oh, and God, especially with the automation that's happening these days. I know, and AI and ML and machine learning and shit like that's not that's probably like 20, 30 years away from being a reality. I mean, the four day working week is picking up momentum everywhere we look. So, yeah, but. In terms of Sark's way of life, um, it sounds pretty idyllic. It sounds very popular with holiday makers. And I genuinely would quite like to go there. I'd imagine we'll have to get there by sea, which is one of my least favorite ways of traveling. But yeah, because um, I do not like vomiting. Uh. And that's always what happens when I go on the water, unless I'm swimming in it. So <laughs> yeah, so Sark, really amazing place. The Barclays decided to fuck with it because they're all powerful lunatics. And then we've got James DeWolf, who is history's top American senator scumbag, basically. Yeah, I I, yeah. I think, I mean, okay, politics produces some pretty horrible, evil people. I think we're going to struggle 
in the Western world to find people who were as knowingly evil as James DeWolf was in public life, just horrible human being. And the Barclays, who were just basically sociopaths, just devoid of any idea of how to operate in normal society. So the rule here is people in positions of power that might appear slightly dodgy probably are 10 times worse when you go, you know, when you look underneath the waterline yeah. and see the rest of the iceberg. Peel back that layer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> kind of shitty. Um, so that's our, our show for this week. Although I didn't do it at the start of the show, I did it in the middle. I'll do it again now. If you'd like to follow us on social media, please go to History's Greatest Idiots on Instagram. Go to at Greatest Idiots on Twitter, where we stream live, actually, so you can catch our live streams there. You can also catch all of our live streams live on Twitch, um, which is on my Twitch channel, which is Why All the Anger. Or you can go to History's Greatest Idiots on YouTube and catch our live streams there. Plus, all of our previous recordings are live on um, YouTube. Live. They're just on YouTube. Yes. Uh, so we, and I did a calculation, Derek. You'll be interested to know this. We have, probably looking at the stop thing now, 84 hours of content now. <laughs> Good Lord. That's in audio and video form. So if you want to consume three and a bit days worth of me and Derek talking about utter human stupidity, please do that. Also go to patreon.com slash history's greatest idiots if you'd like to sling us some money so we can control the lives of peasants living on a tiny island just off the north of Normandy. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of fun researching this. What about you? I mean, it would have been tough researching it, David. It was uh, interesting. It was eye-opening. Mm. It was just a lot of Dude, why the hell did they think that was okay? Yeah, even back then, I, I think it probably people probably knew it wasn't okay. Um, yeah, despite it's... the inherent racism of society at that time, I think most people would have known that owning a human not such a cool thing to do. Yeah, really. Yeah, not yeah. so much. Just gross. Um, man, on the social medias thing though, I mm. kind of want to hear from our fans and followers and stuff on what type of like content that they want to see on their reels and and do yeah. they want little one hitter things like our friends over at Hightailing Through History? Do 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 they want uh, just clips of the show so they can avoid, you know, my randomly laughing at nonsense? Um <laughs> just the good parts. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, honestly, uh, yes, please send us your information. Also, um, if you're listening on the podcast, there is like there are Q&As and polls that we do regularly. Feel free to get with, in touch with us on our social media. Um, we also do both uh, linked in the description of this video and audio. You'll find links to both of our social medias. So mine and Derek's uh, are both linked there. We both have link trees. So please click on those. You can get in touch with us on those various uh, methods as well. We'd love feedback. We would also love to be able to produce more kind of social media content for you guys. We both work full time and we're both married and I have an autoimmune disease and we both have side hustles. So like, it's so difficult for us to produce extra stuff, but we really do want to produce more stuff for you guys. So any suggestions you have, please send them our way and, and we'd uh... love to hear from you. And uh, the anything on the Patreon or buy me a coffee or any of those things goes yeah. a long way to help us pr present more content to entertain you. It really does. And and thank you so much for your time because we've noticed that we have, uh, last time I checked, 666 followers on Spotify alone. I screenshotted uh, that. I don't know why. Yeah, I know. I, <laughs> um, I don't know how many we've got on Apple. Um, I, I, I think uh, Spotify makes up like uh, something like I think it's like 70%. Yeah, yeah. I, of our overall listenership. Um, so I'd imagine we've probably got about another 300 on Apple. I'll find a way to check that soon. So we're probably at 1,000 followers. So to the people out there who who have listened to us for the last like two and a half years, we really do appreciate you all. And You're thank awesome. Thank you so much for your support. You are amazing. And we really enjoy doing this. Like a lot of this is the, one of the reasons I enjoy this so much is because I get to chat to Derek. Every it it is always good. Chat. It's so much fun. And we didn't know each other before we started this podcast. Like I put an advert out there. Derek responded with the most amazing, um, like kind of, or not really an audition, like kind of a, an introduction about himself. And I was like, this is the guy. 
this is the guy I want to do the podcast with. It was it was so good. So I, I'm just yeah. happy he picked me. I'm happy to be here. It was fun. It's, it's been so fun. fun. It is fun. And we will continue to make more. So uh, it's my birthday in seven days, seven days in a week. I will be 42 years old. Happy and... birthday and welcome to the club. Thank you. Uh, I look forward <laughs> to being 42. If it's as good as 41, then I will be constantly exhausted, but reasonably happy. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going away on holiday. Derek has got loads of stuff lined up uh, to take care of, and, and you've got to continue getting your son ready for college and stuff and work. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks when we will have other idiots. I already have someone in mind. Ooh. I, know. I, don't wanna... I kind of do too, but I'm scared of going after Scientologists. Don't be afraid. Do it. Okay. <laughs> they don't sue anymore. <laughs> they're scared of the internet now. Fuck them. Well, and if the Barclays sue me, sue... they're just going to get debt. Yeah, and Barclays, if you're not happy with anything we've said about you, I think I think they're both Barclay brothers are actually dead now. So um, if the descendants of the Barclays want to sue me, I don't think I've said anything inappropriate or out of out of tone or toe with what they've tried to do. But you are welcome to my debt as well. You know, it's it's a mortgage <laughs> and student loans that I still haven't paid off. So, yeah, have at it, boys. Um, so thank you guys so much. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Derek, would you like to say goodbye, please? Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. And we will see you in two weeks. Take care now. Bye. <laughs>